Hey guys, good evening. Hey guys, good evening. Hey guys. Oh, hold on, we are having an echo here. Let me make sure we get rid of it. Hi guys, welcome, good evening. Uh, hey Luigi 1957, hey Water Power 100. Welcome to the another edition. This is a special edition of My Best Losses Monday. And it's very good to see you guys here. Today we have a slightly different stream. Basically, in addition to our normal analyzing on my best losses from the previous week, I have a special task. Uh, we are supposed to uh, select the Brilliancy Prize game from Saturday's Open Field Media Cash Prizes Arena. Um, uh, Alessio Santeramo, who's t-shirt is the is the brilliancy prize and i'm gonna show it here this is basically the brilliancy prize he has allowed he has basically went through the games and she gave us two games to choose from so we are going to we're gonna have to look through them and they're gonna have a very quick poll to determine who the winner of the game of the brilliancy prize is hey so the time it's very good to see you hello chess lions very good to see Daniel Davar. Sosa, we have your game as one of the contenders for this uh, for this prize. So I'm very I'm very happy to see that you're here. <laughs> In addition to this, I'm going to share a couple of games I played over the last weekend. One illustrates uh, something that I would like to correct in my game, namely uh, inability to uh, avoid. Uh, problems associated with a double check and also I had played a very interesting game against Amal Humbleton yesterday in, the, in their sub Sunday that I think it's worth taking a quick look anyway welcome welcome to the stream it's very good to see you guys thank you for being here let's uh, let's start with uh, the, the quick look at the game and I, we have one of the contenders for this uh, award Sosa time who is here Sosa welcome to the stream and this is this is the game so let's take a quick look I'm gonna turn as usual computer analysis so we can take a quick look and the game was basically standard e4 e5 uh, looks like it was a normal Italian variation and after knight c3 which incidentally is a pretty decent book move um, the Sosa's uh, opponent who is actually another stalwart of uh, Alessia Sedermo's channel dead at 3 uh, proceeded with knight e4 and after fork of d5 the, you know it was basically a pretty bad move here which is bishop b3 and yes so so it's also was uh, saying in chat that he was out of here right there and it shows hey korean america just a little bit very good to see you thank you welcome to the stream hi to you too anyway so after there basically takes knight g1 which is a carlson like move but uh, basically out of the whole interaction white is not pawned down but it's you know that pawn is doubled anyway just take a, we're gonna keep take uh, keep following the game uh knight d4 which is an okay game queen g5 was probably stronger d3 knight b3 takes 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 on d3 okay so you know white has a little bit of a problem with the pawn structure but this is still everybody's game however the game become becomes interesting around here and we have you know black is definitely still winning oops sorry we don't want to go all the way to the back right bad so let's go back again bad button to press my apologies and uh, okay so after the queen exchange and bishop exchange this is a position that's reasonably comfortable for black it he black has a couple of pawns there's a couple of pawns up and a better pawn structure but this is still 
uh, you know, plenty of marbles to play or play here. So, knight f3, f6, rook e1, king e3, knight e2. I think it's a right strategic decision to avoid the knight exchange. Knight c4, bishop e6. All normal and all standard. And here is Sosa is slowly starting to climb out of its a bad position. The rook on c6 is actually fairly strong, and after the, you know, doubling the rook, he can play against the pawn on c7. In other words, it has some counterplay here. Hey, Dobroveče, 77 CW. It's very good to see you. Anyway, rook d6, rook c7, and we are slowly approaching the moment in this position when, you know, uh, white is actually doing quite well here. This rook is very active, the pawn is here, and this is where brilliancy starts coming out. It's basically this king run, and this is a very interesting position in which basically thanks to this brave king, we have mate in one, and it's actually a very interesting game in which Sosa, who is 500, almost 500 points underrated, he managed to eke out the victory against uh, against a much stronger opponent. So that's one candidate that Alessia, Alessia suggested for uh, the games that were submitted, and it's a very nice and a very interesting game. I think uh, the strategic decision to move forward with the king it was actually very very brave and if you want brilliant hey alisovi 70 hi welcome to the stream it's very good to see you but uh, very frankly what impresses me in this game the most is that you know here somewhere this is a minus five position for black and from here in the space of about four or five moves uh, you have uh, Sosa is going to basically completely turn this position around and it starts here and you know in a, it's you know this is basically a position that's already drawn and after f5 this is a defensible position for white I think that's a really impressive handling of uh, of end game for Sosa and I have to say that really is impressive and the fact that his opponent blundered into a mate is, is obviously a plus. However, for me this sequence from bishop takes on c you know from putting the knight on a5, this position is minus five and this is one, two, three, four moves uh, yeah. and after f3 the space is six moves this is basically now a draw position that's impressive handling of this rook end game so that's uh, one candidate and the second candidate is between uh, a couple of significantly stronger players uh, one is 2600 another is slippery speedster and another is close to 2000 and so we're going to take a quick look at that um after e4 e5 knight f3 this is fried liver attack or polario as it's officially called and uh, standard fried liver stuff queen f3 is a popular move very frankly i never warmed up to it i think uh, you know my favorite continuation here is to play with b8 the bishop e7 is probably the best and i think it's a tricky it's a tricky uh, it's a tricky continuation but this knight is undefended and in some continuation like something like takes takes queen c6 bishop d7 the fact that the knight on g5 is not defended is actually fairly significant and guys uh, since we're, we started doing with the beginning of the stream just so let me explain what to people who have joined a little bit later what we are doing um Open Field Media Arena last Saturday had uh, had this brilliancy prize, and that brilliancy prize was this great Trollmaster 
t-shirt from Alessia Santeramo merchandise store. And uh, Alessia was kind enough to evaluate the game submitted in on her stream earlier today. And she basically uh, told us that she likes two games so she couldn't choose, so she asked us to choose. So the perp we had a game between Sausage Time, who is actually in chat, and then we also have a game between Ruth Wick and Slippery Speedster. And uh, we are now looking at those two games. So we have a game here, and this is all normal theory. Bishop d7 is actually not the most precise move. And bishop a4, very good move. h6, knight e4, and white is here better. But uh, white needs to be very careful here because uh, it's uh, a little bit behind in development. And very honestly, this bishop and these two knights are a bit too awkwardly placed. And you know, if if uh, black manages to consolidate and play f5 and start pushing pawns, it can be very, very, very tricky very quickly for white. I learned that the hard lesson, I learned that lesson the hard way, firsthand. All right, so let's continue. Bishop e7, d3, all uh, normal moves. Uh, Bishop d3. Okay, takes on d3, takes on d3, f5. And this is a basic demonstration of the strategic plan that black has in this position, which is basically to push f5 and to keep, uh, you know, using these awkward positions of these two knights to open up the position and attack the, attack the white king. And to be honest, if I were white in this position, I would have castled already. But anyway, the game continued. Sacrifice on d5, okay, nice. Takes on d5, knight c3, or, or ex sorry, exchange on d5, not the sacrifice. And now this, frankly, this pawn, pawn phalanx and computer concurs with me, looks pretty scary. I prefer black's position here. All right, so game continued, e4 takes on e4, takes on e4, and uh, yeah, d4 might have been more precise, and queen e2, okay, bishop c6, and d4, which is actually, although a fork, is, uh, is a little bit of a blunder because it allows queen c4, and after queen c4, a white can take on d4 with a better position. Okay. And just to clarify for everyone, we are... Hey, Davina! It's very good to see you here. Welcome to the stream. We are looking at two uh, finalists for Brilliancy Prize in Open Field the Marina from last Saturday. The Brilliancy Prize is this very lovely Troll, troll Master t-shirt from Alessia Santeramo. And this is a game between Grand GM Ruthwick, who is a 2000 player, and Slippery Speedster, who is a very strong, almost 2600 player from Australia. And okay, so it looks like that uh, Black is here attacking. And this uh, castling queen side is very frankly tempting because there is a pin on d8, but the computer doesn't like it. And to be honest, <clears throat> I don't like it either because there is a lot of open positions here and uh, you know, white king is not entirely safe. On top of it, uh, the board is fairly open and these bishops are gonna come into play. Anyway, so continue bishop f6, computer hates it. Knight b5, which computer also hates it because the best move was queen c4. Okay, and then d3, which is a scary move. Uh, queen h5, and this is where things start to become messy. Uh, queen a5, okay. So what the black is threatening here is to play d2, and then you know after d2 check. Yeah, uh, black white almost needs to play king b1 and then there is a unless there is a queen a1 mate. So let's take a quick look at the rest of the game. C4. That 
doesn't appear like a like a very precise move, but it does defend the the knight to b5, which is pinned, which was pinned, and after continuation, take on b5, take on b5, and that's finally the decisive blunder in this position. Uh, yeah, queen a1 takes. Queen d2 is forced, and then queen b2, and bishop c3. I think black managed the managed the miss the mate in one. Okay, queen f1 is also not the best move, but at this point I think white is lost, and after king g1, queen d1 is mate. Okay. So, um, what, you know, I have to admit that I'm a little bit hard-pressed to choose to choose among these two games myself. Obviously, these games are, yeah, it's a nice game from Sravan, agreed. Uh, it's a very interesting game, this is normal theory. I think the best part of the game was basically this... Uh, march of the black pawns this phalanx of three pawns that went through and ultimately it was these pawns on this these f e and uh, d pawns that kind of decided the game that busted wise position hey server engine it's very good yes you turned out exactly exactly the right time we are actually looking at your game and I have to say I'm very impressed. This was impressive attack, and Alessia picked this up as a, as one of the two candidates, two finalists for uh, the Brilliancy Prize. And to share everybody once again the Brilliancy Prize, this is the Trollmaster T-shirt. Is the Brilliancy Prize for this arena? And I have to say uh, this was a very impressive final attack. And obviously after king g1, you know, queen d1 is mate. So, um, on the other hand, I think it's a little bit, uh, I don't want to say unfair, but it's, uh, you know, it needs to be taken into consideration that first two players, first game was played by a 900 pl 983 player Sosa time, who is also in chat in addition to Strawberry Engine. And somebody who is 500 up, 500 points stronger. But I think it's only fair here to do to do this. And hey, Prillwood, my friend, it's very good to see you. So we're going to have a little poll. And let's see. And I've, I will let the poll, the audience choose what... And the question is, who should win the Brilliancy Prize? Okay, and the candidates are... And I'm gonna call, use... It's Slippery... Uh, slippery... And uh, no, two Ps... Speedster... Which is Trevor Engit, who is here and there... And... The second candidate is Sosa time. And I think uh, two, you know, one minute should be short poll is fine. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I think Alessia wanted my audience to choose this. I think it's, it's fair. All right, so. All right, guys, so please vote. Uh, there is no rigging. There is no point. Vote for points. So please, uh, please vote. And based on your vote, uh, as the poll ends, we're going to award the prize. Who should win this? Uh, Strava Ranget, Slippery Speedster, who was black in this game against GM Ruthvik, which he had a very masterful final attack here. Or, so that's one candidate. It's a pretty impressive game. I really, I have to say, I really like that final attack a lot. Or Sosa Time, who was white against the dead 3-3-A-3-3, who basically rescued a completely lost position by actually very well played 
you know, uh, two rook, four rook end game. And yes, you guys can vote. And congratulations, uh, the poll has ended. And it looks like Slippery Speedster, which is server Edgit, has won. So, congratulations again, uh, server Edgit. Please uh, send me how you want us to get you the t-shirt. We're gonna need some sort of an address to ship, the, ship it to. And the award is yours. This is the Trollmaster t-shirt from Alessia Santeramo collection. Congratulations, I would be, and you have Sosetan, who is a true gentleman, who is congratulating you. So two finalists were both in the chat. And I have to say, Sosa, you, if you have won, it would have been also quite fair. So there you go. Anyway, all right. And I think we're gonna continue the tradition of uh, of some sort of uh, brilliancy prize in a rather in, in all these uh, in all these tournaments so we're gonna have one other in uh, this coming sunday all right and i think uh, it was close i think the results of the poll were very close and very frankly i frankly i'm supposed to be neutral so i didn't vote but i would be hard pressed to vote in the end i would i honestly wouldn't know whom i did, would vote for anyway all right, so so getting back to the to discussing uh, discussing my games, I want to show you two games. One game that I played very recently. I think I played this uh, in sad battle against uh, against the, against the player whose handle is uh, uh, called All Guns Blazing and. Thanks to my dear friend and uh, uh, sub in multiple channels, Chestnut KZ, I knew that I was going to play against all guns blazing, so I got the chance to study and open a little bit. And I'm going to just run for this game really quickly. And I'm going to... So he played a normal Sicilian Hyper Accelerated Dragon, and I'm going to turn the analysis board. So you guys can actually see it. Yes, and for the record, the game was very short, and it was. It, I think it stays within the theory, and you will see, um, you know, why that 99.3% accuracy is actually perfectly understandable. And actually, I, I let me put it this way: no way, no way, suspicious. At least not as far as I'm concerned. So knight d4, knight c6, c4, bishop g7. For what's worth, I have played a lot of games against Hyper Accelerated Dragon, and I have uh, I have experimented with lots of continuations against it. Uh, you know, there are a couple of plans here in this position. You know, White can basically decide if he's going to play. Hey, Latino Blonde, thank you for subbing for four months in Tier One. It's uh, quite possible to play this like a normal dragon and play knight c3, f3, bishop e3, and then bishop either to, you know either on e2 or c4, and then starts attacking. I've discovered that I like uh, to play this, and that actually took some effort. I really hey Latinum blonde. Thank you, my dear friend. Thank you for five tier one subs. That's very, very, very greatly appreciated. And so it's very good to see that. Oh, Trevor Engine got the sub. Welcome, Freddy Patzer, Thunder Horse 350. Kitty, kitty, his, his, my dear friend, got the sub. And finally, Ocelot 893. Thank you so much for, for this. It's very greatly appreciated. So I've decided that I really like to play these uh, Marozzi bind positions with characterized by C4, which this particular move order allows. And uh, I have uh, had plenty of experience in this position. I had a actually online lesson. Uh, yes, the Essendon Desert CW and is always the Jabba Yugoslavian. He's referring to uh, Yugoslav attack, yes, with the F3 variation. And true Severangit, and uh, I have uh, 
you know, I discovered the playing these Marazzi bind positions. Marazzi bind, incidentally, is characterized by this c4 and e4 pawn formation. I dis discovered that I like it, and I had a very good uh, lesson with Danya. It's on my YouTube channel uh, that actually was dedicated to how to play the, those positions. If you put exclamation mark YouTube, you will see the you will have a link and the channel my lessons with Danya are there and I think I acquired a pretty good Zen in these positions the strategy here is basically for white to maintain these outposts but not just to maintain e4 and c4 pawns before I had lessons with Danya I played f3 and b3 and that's a little bit passive what Danya explained to me is that in these positions, uh, white should go for complete domination in space and play b4 and f4 whenever white has a chance. So, um, and you will see this basically stayed within the realms of uh, standard theory. Bishop g7, normal move, bishop e3, reinforcing the knight on d4. A knight f6, all of these are book moves, knight c3, a castle, uh, bishop e2, and this is basically the standard Marazzi bind uh, setup. And now here, you know, black has several options. One option is to play something along the side of a6. Another option is to play rook e8. Another option is to play uh, h5 to prevent any attack by white because in, s in many variations, and incidentally I even played this against the Sergei Karyakin, uh, there is a plan to push f4 and g4 and h5 kind of does prophylactics there. So this is all very, very nice and very good theory, theory I'm very familiar with, especially since thanks to chess noob, I knew who my opponent was, so I even get the chance to maybe spend 20 minutes refreshing my memory. So uh, I, he played d6, which is a perfectly normal move. Uh, and after castle, uh, bishop d7, uh, queen d2, as you can tell, this you know computer is still reading this as a book move. These are this is all standard theory. Um, knight d4, which is again theory, takes takes bishop uh, bishop to c6. And here is one very important question: it is how to reinforce uh, this line. And I actually had this position on the board. Uh, in my in my preparation and believe it or not one of the possible theoretical lines here is to push b4 and basically forego this pawn on e4 and then play bishop f3 after the exchanges and that gives white a little bit of advantage and then you exchange uh, because this pawn cannot be really be taken now let me show you actually the actual line so b4 which computer is actually not gonna like but uh, you know it if you play something like this and then you take and then you take and then bishop g7 you know obviously if it's captured there is a queen d4 and, and white is gonna end up with a pawn with a with a piece up um i you know it, it translated into very wild position that very frankly i wasn't comfortable getting into so i decided to play it safe and temporarily just pushed f3 which is which is actually a more solid variation here and i'm actually great uh, here oh uh, so it's the time this whole game until about uh, you know, like first 15 moves will be all theory, believe it or not. Um, so, anyway, so uh, a5, and here the the justification of the of the a5 is that basically an illustration of what I mentioned at the beginning of this stream. One plan for white is to push b4, and a5 is there to abstract this uh, this particular plan. It's a perfectly good and it's a perfectly natural. It's actually probably the best move in this position. Hey, Matt Quick Chess, it's very good to see you. Thank you. And easy there, bud. It's very good to see you. And yeah, Ben Fagel style, still theory. But 
you know, when Ben, ben said, says this, it's, um, he's joking, but this really is still theory, believe it or not. And uh, the thing here is the problem with a5 is that it creates an outpost on b5 for, for, the, for the white knight. And uh, this is actually going to come into play, believe it or not, in this, in this game, this weakness of the b5 square. Anyway, I played b3, which is, uh, you know, reinforces, uh, reinforces e4. And, you know, I ended up with this particular uh, pawn structure that I actually do not really like. But you can do it if you understand that it's temporary. And again, we're still, this is move 13, we're still, in, we're still playing by the book. And after knight d7, and here is one of the justifications why f4 and b4 are important, among other things. These knights um, really like to go on c5 or e5. And one of the elements of white's play is to prevent them from reaching those two fields. Hey, Durki, my friend, it's very good to see you. Welcome to the stream. I'm showing a game I lost in uh, yesterday after in the sub battle of uh, Dina versus Anna Muzichuk. And, uh, you know, it's, it's actually a fairly instructive game. And it's, I'm going to illustrate one tendency of mine that I'm going to spend some time working on. And I'll, you will see that in a few seconds. Anyway, and uh, another thing is that, uh, that we have a winner of the Brilliancy Prize, who is this lovely Alessia Santerago t-shirt. And uh, so it's Slippery Speedster, as, as it was actually in Alessia's channel. So anyway, uh, hey, thank you. Cinema Sevgisi, thank you for the follow. That's very greatly appreciated. And guys, we are approaching 3,000 followers. When we reach 3,000 followers, we are going to have a special, uh, special open field media event. So please do us a follow if you're not uh, already following us. So I here decided that I'm really not going to allow, you know, I didn't want to exchange this uh, uh, dark square bishop. Although normally, you know, getting rid of the bishop on g7 is important in this position. The whole black square complex is uh, is very important for uh, for white. So I didn't want to make that weak. So I played bishop e3, which is the best move. Bishop knight c5, taking advantage of the fact that this is basically an available, very strong uh, place for the knight. Rook b1 which is, I think, a perfectly fine move. I'm basically, the, re the justification for rook b1 is pushing uh, a3 and then b4. And uh, after that, queen b6, best move. Rook, uh, rook to c1. And you see here is, uh, uh, here I missed the best move and as best move was to play knight knight on d5 and then basically try to generate some activity along the along the c file even at the cost of double pawns and to try to play on having the bishop pair anyway um knight c8 rook c2 now they're just the, the reason for rook c2 is is uh, there are several several good reasons it allows uh, rook to be swing swing either on c file or it also in some variations is defense this a2 pawn and and this is actually going to end up being played uh that allows retreat to c1 and you will actually see that line very shortly h5 h5 prevents any plan by pushing on g4 because white really cannot push g4, uh, g4 uh, with the with a uh, with a pawn on h5 uh, to continue knight d5 is still a really good move basically i'm preparing to open up the you know to play i'm threatening to take on e7 and uh, Black is here in a little bit of a straight, uh, unpleasant decision to either it can exchange the knight on d5, lose the bishop pair, or to 
or to tolerate the knight and play queen d8. And you will see that the best computer move is knight to take on d5 and queen d8 is kind of a secondary move. All right, so bishop d5, e d5, which I think makes makes sense given that this pawn is weak. And if it's ever pushed and these d pawn and e pawn are exchanged, then pawn on d6 will become weak. And, you know, I think I judge this position to be really good for me. I was actually quite happy with my position. So he played queen b4, attempting to, you know, force me into a queen exchange. And, you know, and queen c1 is, follows up with, you know, the plan. That's one of the reasons why rook c2 was played. I want to keep the queens on board because at some point white has an attack. And here is, uh, here is when, you know, here is how, this is the key moment in the game. Uh, white is slightly better or significantly better, depending on how much you believe this uh, evaluation of plus 0 0.87. Um, I have a problem that I am missing too many. Hey, Hotto Gang, thank you for the follow. Uh, yours truly, for someone who is, what, 1940 here, 1950 now, doesn't really matter, very close to 2000, I'm missing way too many very simple tactics. And, you know, time was not a factor. One minute and 23 seconds on three plus two is perfectly, it's actually an ample amount of time. I have this, um, how to call it, uh, blinders <clears throat> that I am missing uh, opponent's resources. And, you know, I basically fell here, queen b6, best move, uh, which basically tr indirectly pins this bishop here. And, uh, you know, and yours truly you know, the idea and long-term plan here is for white to push bishop h6. Uh, problem here is that, you know, when you have this battery here, that's precisely the wrong moment to do this. And what I basically did, I, I completely have overlooked possibilities that black has in this position. Call it blindness, call it... Uh, lack of tactical vision, call it however you want it. So I played a really one of the worst moves I, one can, you can play in this position. I played bishop h6. And bishop h6 misses this. And unfortunately, you know, I cannot even play anything, anything meaningful because after, uh, you know, queen e3, uh, Black can play this, uh, you know, bishop d4, and the queen is fallen. And after bishop e3, which is why I played in the game, unfortunately, the same move, which is bishop d4, uh, basically loses the queen. And hey, Hotto Gang, thank you for joining the stream and thank you for the follow. -up. So, um, yeah, queen d1 is, uh, I guess, a decent move. The problem is that then, you know, after king f1, it doesn't really matter. This is now a completely lost position. So, um, what happened here was that, you know, this is, you know, up to this point, this is a very well played game. Uh, I have no problem looking at it, and I have no problem, you know, it's, 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 it's a perfectly fun game. Hey, Matt, Matt Thielen, thank you for the follow, that's very great, I appreciate it, thank you. You know, I basically blundered on one move tactic after playing a very good opening, and uh, basically throwing away the game in, in one move. Um, you know, and mind you, my opponent played 99.3 point accuracy, uh, and I actually had, um, you know, I had a really good 
I think I, until that blunder, I had a much better position, which means that you know my accuracy was close to that, and yet I blundered uh, it here. Um, I cannot, I cannot take the knight. I mean here, I cannot take the knight uh, Rafa because this is a discovered check, and uh, you know this knight is vulnerable. I, I, I can't take it. And I basically missed, I even op removed my bishop who was protecting this uh, because I was, I had a blindness for my own plan which involved pu pushing my, uh, you know, which involved playing bishop h6 as a opportune moment, but this wasn't an opportune moment. So I have to say I was pretty upset with myself after this game. I. In my defense, I had some iron issues to deal with it during the game, but that doesn't excuse this. I do this on a rather regular basis. And just to illustrate my propensity for losing position, uh, very well played openings in one move, I'm going to show you very briefly a game that I played against uh, Grandmaster Anna Muzichuk, uh, in which, if you can tell, I have 87.9 accuracy, she has 51.3. And, you know, I basically caught her, caught Anna in an opening preparation. Uh, and, you know, after playing f4, which is, which is basically prep, um, for all intents and purposes, uh, it's very hard for, uh, for black to maintain this position. Because if, uh, you know, if, uh, and I'm going to turn the analysis here, if, uh, the obvious move, which is EF4, fails to Queen D4, obviously, and a another move that uh, you know GF4 fails to Rook F4. So this was all part of the opening preparation, and Anna played Queen E7, which is actually not the be best move, and after FG5, HG5. Bishop takes in h4. This is a plus six position in which all I have to worry about, very frankly, after queen c5 is again the same problem. And you know, it's very easy. I could just play king h1. Computer best move is to play rook f2 uh, or whatever is uh, actually, uh, you know, or uh, to take, uh, you know, take on f7 and then. Or even take on f7, it will actually calculate rook f2 as the best move when it settles down. I have this uh, singular blindness and in there, and this is how the game ended. Knight f3, and obviously after that double check, I just didn't see the simple one move tactic. So. Uh, hey, Paul Match Destroyer, my friend. Welcome to the stream. It's very good to see you. I'm, I'm showing a game that I lost against all guns blazing because in a position that was objectively equal in which I'm probably slightly better, I played, I basically opened my king up to a discovered check. I completely had a blinkers for my own plan and I completely overlooked it and then I lost the game. Uh, yes, hey Japanese tutor, it's very good to see you. Let's give a quick shout out to my, my dear friend, the Japanese tutor, who is a big uh, friend and a great player. He his streams are very instructive. He has this very educational streams. I I lurk sometimes and I watch his wads when I when I can't watch it. The, you can learn a lot about chess from watching Japanese tutors. So please give him a follow if you already haven't. Anyway, so um, anyway, so basically I need to. You, Hey, Joe Bruin, my dear friend, it's very good to see you. A big, quick shout out to me, my dear friend, Joe Bruin, who is uh, a fellow streamer and uh, a dear friend of the channel. Please give Joe, Joe a follow and a shout out. He, ha he plays a lot of chess and him and I played, played a few games and played a lot of Among Us games too. So give Joe, Joe a shout out. He is... He's a great, great guy and a great fellow streamer and a friend of this channel. All right, so I was a little bit salty and um, 
but uh, to uh, in the other game you mean in this game to pin the knight the best move you mean that's basically what I played so sir so. oh against the Anna Muzichuk um, you mean here oh yes actually the thing is this bishop is already dead but yeah i mean as a matter of fact the sosa that's the that's the third best move you can play bishop e3 it's actually not the best move but yeah it's it's definitely better than what i played <laughs> you know i have just you know honestly just step out of the check and forget about computer radiation this is a completely wrong position for white anyway Anyway, so to cut a long story short, um, to answer Joe, Joe Bruin's question, I'm actually uh, going to stream our Among Us games uh, very, very soon. I am, I may even stream, stream them this Saturday. So I would actually love to start doing some Among Us streams. So look, looking forward to that. Anyway, to get back to I want to show you one more game which is actually a more interesting game this is a game I played uh, in uh, in sub battle yesterday and it's against uh, you know chess bride's grandmaster Amal Humbleton who is actually a fairly tough opponent for me he adopted me in I think second of the adoption matches I played he's a great guy he's a great and obviously I don't need to tell anyone about chess Brad channel they're one of the they're the premier chess channel on twitch and they're great streamers uh so you know uh me saying give them a follow i think uh, i mean doesn't even make sense there they're they're vast they're very they're probably one of the most famous channels on on twitch uh, um they make chess look cool anyway so i played this in a sub battle and if you, I'm going to show this game because uh, it was a it was a fairly instructive game, and it's a similar opening as the one I played against Olgan's Blazing. Again, it was uh, this time it was Taimanov, and it was Taimanov with uh, Marazzi Bind. And the difference between Taimanov in Marazzi Bind and Taimanov in uh, uh, you know, in the in the acceler in the Marozzi bind in hyper accelerated dragon, is that um, you know black in this in Taimanov has an option of playing bishop b4, and one thing that Danya taught me was that the right place for the queen, and this is actually going to come into play, is the is you need to play at some point queen d3. And that's the key move in this position, because uh, Queen on d3 first can roam around the third, uh, you know, third rank, and in quite a few positions, Queen g3 is a very tricky move for White. And if Queen ends up on h3, it can actually attack. So uh, it, it's it's really I have to give uh, Danya a huge credit because uh, Dania is one of the best people, best coaches, best trainers there to very quickly explain a Zen of the position and strategic plans. Uh, Linus B3, my rating in USCF is uh, based on three games. It's provisional and I think it's something like 1600. Realistically, my uh, my i'm probably somewhere between 1900 and 2000 uscf uh, that's my rating on on also chess.com chess.com blitz on lee chess i'm 2100 something in in classical that's my highest rating anyway for what that's worth i don't know whether that translates into anything anyway so uh, to continue this, Queen C7 is uh, again a normal, normal standard book move. Uh, bishop E2 is that's where the that's where the bishop belongs in in any kind of uh, Marozzi bind position. And ah, we're getting a raid. Thank you for. Let's see. So anyway, oops. 
All right, thank you, Chess Lions. Uh, so, you know, Bishop ET is a normal book move. A6, preventing any kind of Knight B5 trickery. All are standard moves. Uh, A max P310. That's very good to see you. That's uh, very fascinating about uh, about the B. I'm not sure what you have necessarily in mind with it, but it's 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 a great copy pasta. Anyway. Uh, oh, Julian, thank you for the raid with a party of 17. Uh, welcome, welcome raiders. This is my best losses Monday. I'm showing a game from that I played yesterday in a sub battle against Grandmaster Amon Humbleton. A huge shout out to my dear friends uh, Julian Landau, who is a fellow streamer and a dear friend of mine. So give Julian, I think Julian is aiming to become a partner, Twitch partner like myself. So please give him a follow. And also dear friend of mine, you know, a fellow streamer, Worship is also here. So give Worship, uh, Worship also a follow. He is he's a legend in chess community. Please welcome worship. It's very good to see you, my dear friend. Uh, follow and a shout out are definitely in order. Anyway, so I'm showing a game that they played against Grandmaster Amar Hamilton yesterday. And interestingly, this is another Marozzi bind position. That's one of the reasons I'm showing this. And uh, castling is a natural move here. Knight f6 is normal, knight c3, these are all book moves. Taking on d4 is actually a little bit unusual, but uh, that's perfectly fine. And very frankly, bishop b4 that computer likes here is... Uh, um, I think once the white king castles, uh, bishop b4 loses some of its, uh, its potency. So, uh, you know, computer, I think that knight d4 is a perfectly normal move. Takes knight c5 and we're returning back to d3 and one thing that i'm forever be grateful to dania is the queen belongs in d3 in any kind of marozzi bind position whether it's against the uh, khan whether it's against Taimanov, whether it's a hyper accelerated dra dragon queen on d3 really reinforces uh, White's position because it's, you can capture on c3 and also here is another thing assume for a second that instead of bishop c5 uh, you know black uh, black played bishop b4 with an idea that they're going to take on c3 we can actually take on c3 with the queen and then black really cannot grab the pawn on e4 because pawn on g7 is weak so anyway so, so Aman played h6, which is a good prophylactic move. It might be a little bit too slow in this position, if I'm allowed to criticize a grandmaster. But, uh, you know, then a3, I'm preparing b4. Uh, again, the standard motive in this position for white is to play b4 and f4. And once white that achieves, uh, black is really in a little bit of trouble because it's very hard for black to generate any counterplay. To cut the long story short, b6 is a good move. b4, uh, bishop d6, and then f4. Okay, guys. So I am playing. Uh, I'm playing a Mount Humbleton Grandmaster on Mount Humbleton. And this is a position in which objectively, if, if you look at the computer, plus 3.67, in which uh, black is strategically lost. Uh, it's, uh, it's really has, it's very hard for black to generate any counterplay here. Uh, the, there is an immediate threat of e5. There is an immediate, uh, there, there are multiple immediate threats. Uh, this bishop can go to b2, king can go on h1, and in some continuations here, playing g4 is actually very strong. And, uh, you know, and on top of it, I'm ahead on time. Though, when you play a man, it's, uh, you know, a man can basically play 10 games in a row just on a two second increment that uh, he is very fast. So, uh, I would love to have this position again. 
The problem is that after Aman played e5, which is objectively not the best move, but it's an attempt to mix it up a little bit. I played, uh, I, I played a bad move. And it's a bad move because objectively, uh, you know, the easiest play for white here is to just play rook d1, ask the question from this bishop where it's going to go, and then, you know, put the knight on d5, and then, you know, proceed squeezing, squeezing black uh, out of space, maybe even push, you know, because I'm going to just show you the, not even the first computer line, because I considered this during the game. Uh, rook d1, uh, bishop e7, knight d5, knight d5, e d5. And there is an immediate threat of d6. Uh, where exactly is this bishop going? How is white going to castle? There is an immediate threat of d6 and take on e5, which is an immediate loss. And please don't ask me why I didn't play this. This would have been a much better uh, decision than what I ended up playing here. And what I ended up playing here was is, is not that bad of a move. Yeah, I worship exactly why I didn't play that. I considered it, but I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, be a little bit tricky and you know I played the queen g3 and queen g3 actually doesn't throw uh, throws only half the advantage the position is still won for uh, um, yeah rook d1 queen a7 yeah well knight d5 and you know and so on but um, you know I play queen g3 and that's not objectively, that's far from a losing move. The position is still uh, much better for white, but it's, uh, it's a risky move because it forces on white a lot of calculations in a blitz, in a blitz game. And, uh, you know, anyway. To, so, but the reason I'm showing you, showing you this game is not so much this. It's really very illustrative game as to how to play Marazzi bind against Khan. Because this, in this particular position, white has everything white can dream about in, in this type of a position. Converting it is something else. Converting it at against the Grandmaster, it's even more something completely different. But this is a very beautiful, beautiful position to play with. And God knows, you know, you, you don't get this every time. All right, so Queen G3, that's perfectly fine. That's not fine, but it's okay. F5 is the best move. And this frankly looks a little bit scary for black. Uh, queen, queen H7, and uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to start uh, praising myself here, but somewhere around this time, Aman actually started thinking very seriously and didn't even notice that the brats were raided by Bottas live. Uh, he missed the raid because he was so focused. Uh, so, you know, one. One small redeeming quality of this game was that I got 100% focus from uh, from uh, somebody as strong as uh, Aman. So anyway, so this is still perfectly fine. Uh, Queen H4 is 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 an excellent move. I'm threatening to take on H6 and obviously take there and you know Bishop G5 and so on. Bishop E7 is the best move. Uh, Rook F3 is. Um, an okay move, it's not a good move. Computer prefers uh, g4, which is objectively a much better move. Um, however much I actually like my uh, my attacking prowess, uh, you know, uh, my ability to uh, play sustain attack on a high level is still not, not where it should be. Uh, so, I played rook h3, bishop b7, and you will notice that for the past, uh, you know, three or four moves, Aman is basically playing all best moves, rook h3, I'm still better, but I'm not sure I'm winning. Knight g8 is another best move, 
queen h5 is still okay, but you know, what used to be plus 4 is now plus 0 0.69. Hey, Fandevane Corrales, thank you for joining the stream, it's very good to see you. Oh, and I should have changed that featured event, my apologies. Uh, next featured event is actually in Arena that's happening this coming Saturday, which is on December 19th, my bad. Anyway, so after A5, which is a tricky move because it's aimed for a counterplay along the A file, I played an, a, a one move that I'm actually still upset with myself here. Um, I really did, there was no need to play uh, knight b5. Knight b5 is uh, a move that basically throws away the advantage. What I needed to do here was to just push b5 and not allow the a file to be open. And also, b5 would have prevented a counterplay because queen on c6 hits g2 and also queen on c6 defends h6. So b5 was a move that would be maintaining the momentum of the attack that I should have played. Well, I didn't. Uh, this is why this is my best losses and this is why I'm, you know, uh, I hope one of these days to be able to spot these uh, uh, moves of that kind. Anyway, to continue, knight b5, queen c6, and obviously this queen c6 is now a very strong move, it's threatening e4, it's defending h6. So I played bishop f3, and what I really should have done was to basically hit f6, and, you know, or even play bishop g5, though, you know, or even, you know, a, this is already not a very good position, even rook, uh, bishop d3 would have been better. Um, anyway, computer likes f6, but anyway. So bishop f3 is, again, one mistake. Uh, okay, uh, takes, and then obviously I cannot take on b4. I played g4, and this is, um, this is a perfect example of uh, what unfortunately happens in lots of my games. I'm playing the right move. Um, you know, I'm playing a right move uh, maybe three or four moves too late. I've done this in quite a few of my adoption matches. Uh, I've done this hack against Sergei Karyakin. I had a winning move that, a move that I actually saw one move too late when it was no longer winning. And g4 in, you know, uh, would, instead of rook h3, you know, would have been, instead of rook h3, let me go back, here would have been a really, you know, much better move. But I didn't play it then. I played it, you know, three or four moves too late. And basically the game here went out of uh, there. Yeah, worship uh, seeing, uh, seeing the move one to the tempo too, low, too, too late. And yeah, it's very hard to calculate. Um, in many ways, you know, okay, so the queen here is not trapped because I can play queen e5, but unfortunately my attack after bishop f6 is no longer there. I don't have the firepower and obviously this rook is falling and, you know, this was basically a lost position. Um, I still said a few tricks. And then finally this, after playing e5, which I was hoping to deflect the queen from, from c6. Uh, unfortunately, Aman can take on f3 with a rook, which in a Russian, I'm here down to three seconds, I didn't see. Then I grab, uh, this was actually queen g6 was a pre-move. And <laughs> at this point I resigned, this was basically, <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Was a lost game. Okay. Ah. So. So here is, I'm a little bit, have to say, uh, <clears throat> conflicted what to. <clears throat> my apologies, guys. <clears throat> what to make of this game. 
<clears throat> On the other hand, my handling of the opening <clears throat> is excellent. I mean, <clears throat> Danya would be proud. Um, you know, this is a basically this position and this is a position after 13 moves is strategically won for white and uh, I don't want to say easily won because I just managed to lose it but this should have been you know a relatively easy win uh, all I needed to do after e5 you know to instead of you know to playing e5 and then f5 instead of playing queen g3 I should have played rook d1 and that would and continue playing this positionally <clears throat> thank you dirk yes i do need to hydrate that's very greatly appreciated thank you my friend uh, one thing that lizzie pact uh, kept kept saying and kept telling me was that and so does alex lopez is when you have a completely dominant position there is really no need to risk and queen g3 was a bad move but it was also strategically bad move because it it's a risky move in a position that really sh there was no need to take any risks um oh congratulations worship 1801 is that if that's a, if that's a lifetime congratulations i remember i remember those milestones and that's very that's very impressive that's very impressive progress congratulations my friend i'm very very happy for you anyway to so you know the attack was not that bad you know i you know i need the g4 here should have been automatic you know there is more and g4 was an opportunity uh, many times later i considered it I considered it a little bit risky, but truth be told, it was uh, there is really no way for black to take advantage of it, and then pushing g5 would have been decisive. Um, but anyway, I think I was kind of worried that after knight e4, then I didn't want to get into this, which would have been, you know, a little bit ugly. Uh, but uh, as it transpires, there is really no need for white is very much winning in this continuation, uh, which is so. To and then the game slowly slip out of my hand, and might be five was just a blunder. Anyway, so uh, you know, uh, what is the sum total of? You know these the, these three games I I will have sh I, I'm showing you tonight. I've in one game actually in game against Long Guns Blazik I simply made a blunder that overlooked in one move one move tactic, and I do that a lot. And I did the same thing against you know Anna Anna Muzicuk here. You know I basically walked into a mate needlessly in a in a completely one position against the against the grandmaster on the other hand i think i handled this opening really well and i ended up with a really nice position uh the trick here is very frankly for me is i think the easier the the lowest fruit on the tree here is to figure out how not to blunder one move tactics I don't know whether it's the fact of con lack of concentration, whether it's the lack of chess vision, whether it's a tactical um, problem, but I'm going to work on it and I'll keep you guys posted and I hope that I won't have many games of this kind in, in future streams. Anyway, uh, this is uh, uh, all for today's, uh, today's stream. And just as a, by way of a summary, we have awarded Slippery Speedster uh, a brilliancy prize for Open Film Media Arena on, that, that was completed on Saturday. Thank you, Alessia, for, uh, for participating in this. 
Uh, thank you, worship. That's very kind of word uh, from you. And look, uh, yeah, if, I, honestly, and then maybe a possibility. Any other title is is um, is not gonna happen. But thank you. Your kind words mean uh, mean, mean a lot. The awards is this Trollmaster T-shirt. Uh, Slippery Speedster Stravarenji to my, uh, my dear friend. We are gonna. Uh, it's gonna probably take us a little bit of time because I haven't yet received the T-shirt. We're gonna be touched for DMs. And uh, my next stream is with one and only Lizzie Pechts. It's at 7 a.m. on Wednesday, and uh, I have sent her. I've sent her these two games, one from Amman and all guns blazing, and I'm looking forward to what she's going to say. Anyway, thank you guys for being here. It's always good to see you here. I uh, Next, uh, let's, the most important question now is to see who we are going to raid. You know, we have never raided my dear friend and fellow streamer and a great chess player, the one and only Alberto champion, Omid Malik. So let's raid Omid today uh, and give Omid a quick, quick shout out and a follow. He streams a lot and we would really like to see him stream more. So I'm going to send you to Omid. And let's see. And I will join you there very soon. Say hello to Omid. Thank you for being here. Seeing you on Wednesday. On Friday, I have my stream with one and only Alec Castana Lopez. And then there is another arena. And there is a special treat on Sunday. I am playing uh, my dear friend, Miss Harmon, in several iterations of Harmon on Sunday for adoption. So that's uh, those are the program announcements. I will see you guys uh, very shortly. I'm sending you to Omid and say hello to Omid for me. Thank you, Tadar Horse. Thank you, Sosa Time. And Sosa Time, congratulations. That was a fabulous game. You did really, really well. That was an impressive, impressive game.